Jesus, and trust.
and then we'll get into Jeremiah 27. Lord, uh, we're grateful to be here just, uh, just to take a break from our busy week, Lord, to gather here in your house to worship you in simplicity, uh, Lord, and then to open your word. And we ask now, Lord, that you would speak to us and that we would have ears to hear your voice and eyes to see the wondrous things in your word and hearts that are open and receptive. Lord, we ask that you would speak into our lives, Lord, from these chapters tonight and from these verses. Pray that your spirit be upon me to teach your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in in chapter 27, uh, Jeremiah uses a prop as a sermon illustration. Uh, And this is not the first time he uses a prop for a sermon illustration. We saw back in chapter 13, Uh, The Lord had Jeremiah wear a linen belt as an illustration. Uh, Then in chapter 19, the Lord had Jeremiah smash a clay pot uh, that symbolized what God was going to do to Judah. He was going to utterly destroy them. Uh, And so now in chapter 27, the Lord has Jeremiah wear a yoke. Not an egg yoke, uh, but like a yoke, like... Uh, you would use for a domesticated animal like a 
an ox or a donkey. Um, uh, which this r raises the question, why does God have Jeremiah use these props and do kind of these symbolic acts? And the reason is because the people are not listening to Jeremiah. They're not responding to his preaching. They're just ignoring the warnings that Jeremiah is giving the people. And so now God resorts to using props and symbolic acts in an attempt to grab the attention of the people of Judah. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus was teaching, and then at a point in his teaching, he began to use parables. He started to tell stories. And the reason he did that was to grab the attention of the audience uh, and to keep their attention. Uh, and that's what God does here with, the, with this yoke and, and this, this prop that Jeremiah is going to use. And, and God, uh, God resorting to using props and these symbolic acts just shows us the extent of God's love for people. He's not willing that anyone would perish in their sins, but that all would come to, the, to repentance and salvation through Jesus Christ. And here we see Him. He sends the prophets to the people of Israel. He sends prophet after prophet. They reject the prophets uh, and so then he begins to use these props and these symbolic acts to try to just get the attention of the people, to awaken them to their condition. They're going to reject that. And then ultimately, God will send His one and only Son as kind of a last resort to get their attention. He'll send His Son. And of course, uh, they'll crucify His Son. Uh, and so the people of Judah, uh, they have ignored God's warnings through the preaching of Jeremiah. And so now he's going to use the symbolic act of wearing a yoke. Verse 1 says, in the beginning of the reign of, now your translation might say Jehoiakim here, it should be Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Uh, so here the Lord now speaks to Jeremiah. This wasn't something that he came up with. Thus says the Lord to me, make for yourselves bonds and yokes and put them on your neck. And so uh, he's instructed to wear a yoke around his neck that's intended for animals, for a beast of burden. Uh, the, a yoke speaks of submission. That's what it symbolizes. Submission. Uh, in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 11, uh, there in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus calls those who are weary and heavy laden to come unto Him for rest. And He says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Taking the yoke of Jesus means submitting to Jesus. It means surrendering. Uh, control to Him, and allowing Jesus to be in charge of you instead of you being in charge of you. That's the idea behind taking His yoke upon you. Giving Him control. So He's to put this yoke around His neck. And then, verse 3, and send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon, by the hand of the messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. So these nations are listed here, Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, Sidon. These are nations that surrounded Judah. These are their, their neighbors. And actually, I have a map for you if you want to pull that map up for me. Uh, you can see the kingdom of Judah kind of in the center of the image. Edom is the yellow area to the south. You see Moab, the purple area. Ammon, the orange. Tyre and Sidon are up there in the Phoenician states, the brown up at the top of the screen. So these are all kind of the, the, the neighboring kingdoms, the neighboring countries around Judah. And the reason that God is speaking now to these, these neighboring nations that are really uh, Gentile nations, 
Uh, the reason is these nations were also threatened by the Babylonians. Uh, they're concerned about the Babylonians just as the kingdom of Judah was. Uh, and so they became allies together, all of these nations, along with Judah. And together they were planning a strategy uh, of, for dealing with the Babylonians. And for that reason, the ambassadors from those nations are gathered in Jerusalem, as it's, as it's referenced to here in verse 3. The messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. They're meeting together to discuss how they're going to deal with the Babylonians. And so God has Jeremiah wear this yoke and go to the ambassadors of these nations who are gathered in Jerusalem to give them this message to deliver to their kings. And here's the message. And command them to say to their masters, to their kings, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are on the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And verse 5 is a really remarkable verse that proclaims the sovereignty of God over all the earth. God here, Yahweh, the Lord, declares that He created the earth, He created man, He created all the living things on the earth. He declares that the earth is His and He can do with it whatever He pleases. He says that He created the earth and man and the beasts uh, by His great power, and by His outstretched arm or His might. Now in Colossians chapter 1, we're told that all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus created the earth and all the living things in the earth. He created man. He created the beasts by His great power and by His outstretched arm. And to save us from our sins, He stretched those same arms out on the cross. Those same arms that He used to create the earth and all the living things upon the earth, He used to save us from our sins and to reconcile us to God through the cross. So go, He goes on in verse 6 to say, And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, notice that, my servant, and the beasts of the field I have also given to him to serve him. So all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land comes, until the time of the judgment of Babylon, when Babylon will be judged. And then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them. And so the Lord announced to these Gentile nations. Again, they're gathered in Jerusalem to discuss how they're going to deal with the Babylonians. And God sends a prophet, Jeremiah, to these ambassadors to tell them that he was going to hand these nations over to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And this just reminds us that God is sovereign over all nations. He's sovereign over all people even people that don't believe in Him. These nations didn't worship Yahweh. They didn't believe in Yahweh. They had their own gods. And yet God is still sovereign over them. God is sovereign over all. And He tells them here that they should submit themselves to the Babylonians. And that, that's the symbolic message of the yoke. Submit to the Babylonians. Take their yoke. Serve Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 7 says again, all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son. Now that, that's an idiom that means that all these nations will serve Babylon for a long time. It doesn't mean literally that they're going to serve Nebuchadnezzar and his son and his grandson. We know historically that Nebuchadnezzar's son succeeded Nebuchadnezzar, but then after that, his brother-in-law came to power, not his grandson. And so th this phrase simply means you will serve Babylon for a very long time. 
And so this is the Lord telling them, you should, you should take the yoke of Babylon and submit to them. Don't try to fight them. Don't, don't rebel against them. Instead, just to surrender to them. In fact, look what the Lord says in verse 8. And it shall be that the nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord, says Yahweh. And he will punish with the sword, the famine, and the pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. This is God's will. Submitting to the Babylonians was God's will. If they refused to submit to the Babylonians, they would be rebelling against God, and God says He will punish them. Now, there's, there's several applications in this for us. First of all, uh, once again, we're reminded that sometimes God asks us to do something that is very difficult to do. Sometimes God asks us to do something that is very difficult to do that our flesh doesn't want to do. That our flesh even rebels against and fights against. And our flesh wants to go the opposite direction. Away from it. I mean, submitting to the domination of the Babylonians, uh, that hardly sounds attractive. That doesn't sound like the best option. That doesn't sound like God's will to us. Certainly God wouldn't want me to do that. But that's exactly what God wants them to do. And again, sometimes God's way is difficult. His way is not always easy. Sometimes His way is hard. So what do we do? What do we do when God asks us to do something we don't really want to do? Well, that's when we have to walk by faith and not by sight. And that's when we don't want to walk by our feelings. Certainly, we don't want to obey our feelings. That's also when we fall back on what we do know about God. We know that God loves us. We know that God loves us so much that He sent His Son into the world to die on the cross for us. To save us. He demonstrated His love for us. We know the promise that He works all things together for our good. And He wants to use that difficult path for our good to make us more like Jesus Christ. And so we trust the Lord with all our hearts. We walk by faith, not by sight. Believing God loves us. Believing God has a good plan for us. In all of this, we don't lean on our own understanding because we can understand it. And how often in a situation like that do we say, I don't understand why God's asking me to do this. I don't understand why God wants me to go this direction. Well, you're not supposed to lean upon your understanding. And we also, we, we pray each step of the way through that difficult path. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. Here's the promise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known, known to God and the result will be the peace of God. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And God's peace which surpasses all understanding. That means it doesn't make sense. It's a time in your life when you shouldn't have peace. It passes understanding. It will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Something else these verses show us. These verses show us uh, that not taking God's path is far worse than taking His path. As difficult as His path may be. The consequences of not taking God's path and rebelling against His plan is much more painful. It's a much more painful way to go. We see that in verse 8. You know, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. 
We are always better off in God's will. We are always better off in God's will than walking in rebellion against His will. Even when His will is difficult. Even when everything in our flesh is saying, I don't want to go that way. You're better off in His will than rebelling against His will. These verses also have application for us regarding how we should respond to an ungodly government or an ungodly ruler. Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan. He's a pagan king. He's ungodly. He was brutal. And yet God told His people to submit to His authority. And as Christians, we're commanded to submit to the government and those in power, whether they're godly or not, whether we agree with them politically or not, whether we like them or not, we are, we are commanded to submit to those that are in authority. Not try to overthrow them. Not rebel against them, but submit to them. And I want to show you a few verses in the New Testament. If you want to turn there with me, Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, first of all. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. That's exactly what God is saying through Jeremiah. That He's appointed Nebuchadnezzar. That Nebuchadnezzar is my servant, he says. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. That's verse 8 of chapter 27. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God, God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake, because the Lord tells you to. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Again, he doesn't say anything here about whether they're godly or ungodly or whether you voted for them or didn't vote for them. We're just to submit to them. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. You want to turn there for me. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter two, verse one. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What, what's good? Praying, praying for kings, praying for those in authority. Verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So here we're told that we should pray for those in authority, for the king. And remember at this time, Caesar's king. And he's telling the believers to pray for, pray for Caesar. Now, go with me over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, because God commands you to. Again, whether you agree with the government or the person in power, you do it for the Lord's sake. Whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And so again, we see submit to those uh, in, in authority, those in power, every ordinance of man, and we do it for the Lord's sake. Now, of course, we're fortunate enough that we live in a democracy where we have the right to vote, and we have the freedom of assembly and the freedom of speech and all of those things. I'm not saying don't exercise your freedom. I'm just saying as Christians, we submit to the government. We're good citizens. And here, back in Jeremiah, if you go back to Jeremiah now, the only exception I would add to that is if the government asks you to do something that violates God's word. Then it's better to obey God than man. But otherwise, we submit to the government. And here back in Jeremiah 27, God is telling His people to submit to an ungodly ruler, a very ungodly king. That's God's will. He goes on now back in chapter 27, verse 9. At this point, again, He's speaking to those surrounding nations. Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, Sidon. He says to them in verse 9, Therefore do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, or those who interpret dreams, your soothsayers, your sorcerers who speak to you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon. Uh, just as, as Judah had prophets, these other pagan nations around them, they had diviners and those who interpreted dreams and soothsayers and sorcerers that they looked to to give them guidance. And Jeremiah says to these nations, do not listen to them when they tell you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. And so as Jeremiah is preaching this message from God, there's also this false message that's being preached to the people. Jeremiah is saying, take the yoke of Babylon upon you, submit to Babylon. But there's these false messengers who are saying, don't serve the king of Babylon. Don't do that. For they prophesy a lie to you. To remove you far from your land. That's what's going to happen if you obey them. And I will drive you out and you will perish. But the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell in it. Now in verse 12, beginning in verse 12, Jeremiah declares this same message to Zedekiah, the king of Judah. I also spoke to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die, you and your people, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon. Therefore, do not listen to the words of the prophets, this would be false prophets, who speak to you, saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. For I have not sent them, says Yahweh. Yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I may drive you out, and that you may perish, you and the prophets who prophesy to you. You know, one of the things that characterized Judah just before their judgment, so in the last days of Judah, one of the things that characterized that time was spiritual confusion. It's a very confusing time. There are a lot of people at that time who are claiming to speak for God, but they have contradicting messages. You've got someone like Jeremiah and the other prophets, the true prophets, who are saying, 
submit to Babylon. But then you've got all these other voices, all of these other people claiming to be speaking for God, who are saying, no, don't submit to Babylon. It's very confusing. Who do you listen to? Who's right? How do you know? Well, and the Bible tells us that in the last days, meaning the, the last days of this age that we live in, that it will also be uh, a, a very confusing time spiritually. It will be a deceptive time spiritually. It will be marked by spiritual confusion and spiritual deception in the world. Jesus Himself even said in the last days, false Christs and false prophets will arise and they will do great signs and wonders deceiving people. And many will be deceived by them and follow their destructive ways. Paul said in the last days the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, but to suit their own desires, they will, will gather around them teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. And so the last days will be confusing spiritually. It will be a confusing time in the world just as it was in the last days of Judah. That's a mark of the last days. It was a mark of the last days in Judah. It's going to be a mark of the last days uh, of, of the world. And so now verse 16. We come to verse 16. Jeremiah now warns the priests and the people. So he just warned Zedekiah the king. Now he's going to warn the priests and the people beginning in verse 16. Also I spoke to the priests and to all this people saying, Thus says the Lord, Do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesied to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. Now, as I've mentioned in a previous study, uh, the Babylonians invaded the land of Judah three separate occasions. On their first invasion, they took some of the gold, some of the gold vessels from the temple and carried it away to Babylon. And that's what he's referring to here, these false prophets. Some of the false prophets were saying that God told them that the vessels would be brought back from Babylon and returned to Jerusalem shortly. Now, why are they saying this? Why are they saying this at this time? Well, we know historically from other historical records outside of the Bible. In particular, there's, a, there's something called the Babylonian Chronicles, which were tablets of stone that recorded the history of Babylon. We know from those tablets that at this same time, there's a revolt that breaks out in Babylon. The Babylonian people begin to revolt against Nebuchadnezzar. And they try to overthrow uh, the king. And so Nebuchadnezzar has to uh, suppress this revolt in his own country. And it seems that some of the people in Judah saw that revolt as a sign of the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And they think this is it. That his reign is going to end. And once his reign ends then all of the, the vessels from the temple will be returned to us. Uh, and, it's, and it's not going to be long now. The problem is he's not overthrown. He's able to suppress the revolt and continue ruling. Jeremiah says they prophesy a lie to you. They're lying to you. Verse 17, he says, do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city, Jerusalem, be laid waste? Then he says in verse 18, But if they are prophets, and if the word of Yahweh is with them, let them now make intercession to Yahweh of hosts, that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and at Jerusalem, do not go to Babylon. He says here, hey, if they are prophets, let them pray that the remaining vessels in the temple and in the king's palace and in Jerusalem are not carried away to Babylon also. For thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, the pillars of the temple, concerning the sea, uh, concerning the carts, and concerning the remainder of the vessels that remain in this city, 
which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take when he carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim. Remember, Jeconiah was one of the kings, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and Jerusalem. They shall be carried to Babylon. And there they shall be. Until the day that I visit them, says the Lord, then I will bring them up and return them to this palace. The false prophets are saying, hey, the vessels that were taken, they're going to be returned to us in a short time. It's not going to be long now. We'll get all those vessels back as soon as Nebuchadnezzar is overthrown. It's all coming back to us. And Jeremiah says, no, in fact, the Babylonians are going to come again and they're going to take what's left and they're going to carry it, carry it all away to Babylon, and it's going to be in Babylon until after the captivity. Uh, And then, verse 22, then it'll be brought back. And so so chapter 27, it ends here in verse 22 with a note of hope for the future. Even though it's all going to be carried away to Babylon, the Lord promises to bring all those vessels back and restore the temple. And this is going to be Uh, This is going to be fulfilled after the captivity in Ezra chapter 1, verses 7 to 11. If you're taking notes, jot that down. Cyrus, the king of Persia, will give an order to return back to the land and to bring all of these vessels back. And so as God here is talking about this judgment that's going to come upon the land, He also has the promise of restoration. And we see here with God he has this, this promise of a second chance. He's the God of the new beginning. That He forgives sins. And He gives us a new start. Aren't you glad for that? That even though we can sin and we can mess things up in our own lives, that, that God will bring restoration. He'll bring a new start for us. A new beginning for us. His mercies are new every morning. Now chapter 28 continues... Uh, with the same theme as chapter 27. It says in verse 1, And it happened in that same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people. So this guy Hananiah confronts Jeremiah in the temple in front of everybody, just there in the temple courts, he confronts Jeremiah. And we don't know anything about this guy, Hananiah, except what's mentioned here. This is the only place in the Old Testament that this guy's mentioned. So all we know about him is he's the son of Azor. Uh, he's from Gibeon. Uh, Gibeon was a, one of the cities of the priests, for the priests, and so he may have been a priest. This is where the priests lived. We can't say that for sure. He's not really mentioned anywhere else in the Old Testament. This is all that is said about him. He confronts Jeremiah and the temple. Notice he says, He spoke to me in the house of the Lord. Verse 2 tells us what Hananiah said to Jeremiah. Thus speaks, this is Hananiah speaking. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts. Hananiah says, Thus says Yahweh. So he's in Jeremiah's face in front of everybody, the priests and the people, and says, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years, I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon And I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, says Yahweh, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Hananiah claims to speak for the Lord. And he says uh, the exact opposite of Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah is wearing this yoke. 
And he's wearing this yoke around town. He's there in the temple. He's got the yoke on. And Jeremiah is saying, you're supposed to submit to the yoke of Babylon. And Hananiah now comes along and says, actually, Jeremiah, you've got it all wrong. Really, what the Lord is saying through that yoke is that He's going to break the yoke of Babylon. Jeremiah, you've got egg on your face. Get it? It's a yoke, yoke, ha-ha. Right? Now, what does this show us? One of the things this shows us is just because someone says that they're speaking on behalf of the Lord doesn't mean they're really speaking on behalf of the Lord. Just because someone says, thus saith the Lord, or someone says, the Lord gave me a word, uh, the Lord spoke to me, or the Lord gave me a word to give to you, and the Lord does that, the Lord speaks to us, the Lord impresses things upon our hearts, the Lord gives us a word of knowledge, uh, and so on. But just because someone says that doesn't mean they're speaking for the Lord necessarily. You have to test it against the Word of God, and sometimes uh, you have to wait and see if it comes to pass. Maybe they're speaking for the Lord. Maybe they're not. It'll be exciting if they are, but we're going to wait and see. And that's how you handle that kind of thing. When someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got a word for you uh, that the Lord told me to tell you. Well, praise the Lord. Let's see. We'll see what happens. Hananiah here, he puts a definite date on this. He said, in two years, all the vessels of the temple will be brought back from Babylon and all the people will be brought back that were carried away in that first deportation, including the former king, Jeconiah, who was carried away to Babylon in that first deportation. He's saying here, hey, God's going to break the yoke of Babylon. That's what that yoke means, Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord. And Jeconiah is coming back. Now, turn back to chapter 22. Chapter 22 in your Bible. This is what the Lord told Jeremiah to tell Jeconiah before he was carried away captive. In chapter 22, verse 26, this is what the Lord said to Jeconiah. So I will cast you out and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born and there you shall die. But to the land to which they desire to return, there they shall not return. Jeremiah said, Jeconiah will die in Babylon and he will never return to Judah. So now Hananiah though, Hananiah contradicted Jeremiah. And you got both these guys saying they're speaking for the Lord. Again, it's a very confusing time spiritually in the nation. Both men claim to be prophets of God. Both claim to be speaking the Word of God. Both guys are saying, thus saith the Lord. But their message, messages were in complete contradiction to each other. It's confusing. Not, not much unlike the times we live in. Where you, you've got people today, especially when it comes to moral issues in our culture, You've got people that claim to be speaking for the Lord. And you've got people like Jeremiah who are speaking the truth of God's Word about these moral issues that our country is wrestling with. And then you've got other people that are also claiming to be speaking for the Lord that are completely contradicting what the Word of God says. And so you've got people in our culture that are declaring uh, the truth and you've got people in our culture that are declaring a lie all in the name of God. That's why it's important to be Bereans and to search the Scriptures for yourself and to know what the Word of God says. So now, in verse 5, we see Jeremiah's response here. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. Again, this confrontation is in the temple. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen! The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. Jeremiah says, Amen, man. So be it. I hope you're right. <laughs> you say everybody's coming back in two years, all the vessels are coming back in two years. Amen. I sure hope that happens. <laughs> 
Now, he knows it's not going to happen. But he says, hey, praise the Lord if you're right. would love for that to happen. That would be awesome if that happened. You know, I, uh, I, I hold um, uh, what is called a pre-tribulation view of the rapture of the church. And what that means is I believe that the church will be raptured to heaven and then uh, the world will go into a seven-year tribulation period And at the end of the seven years, I believe that Jesus Christ will literally physically come back to the earth and set up his kingdom on the earth and literally rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years in what's called the millennial kingdom. Because that's what I believe the Bible teaches. Now, when I go to Israel, there's a little restaurant in Jerusalem where you can sit on the rooftop of this restaurant And from that rooftop, you can see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected. And you can see the Mount of Olives where he ascended to heaven and where the Bible says he's going to return one day and stand on the Mount of Olives at his return. And you can sit at this table and drink a Coca-Cola and see and look at all of these places while you're sitting there drinking a Coke. And I like to think when I sit there that if I'm wrong about my view of the rapture and the tribulation and those that think that Jesus is just going to come back and stand on the Mount of Olives. I'd love for it to be while I'm sitting there drinking a Coca-Cola. You know, that's, I don't think that's what's going to happen, but if it's going to happen, this would be a great time for it to happen. While I'm sitting here with this great mezzanine view deck, you know, view of the whole thing here. And that's, that's kind of what Jeremiah says here. Hey, amen, man. You think it's all going to come back in two years? That would be great, but he knows it's not going to happen. Now watch what he says in verse 7. Look what he says. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster And pestilence. And I want you to note here what Jeremiah does. Because he's got someone now that is also claiming to be speaking the word of God. Who is contradicting what Jeremiah is saying. And I want you to see here what Jeremiah does. Jeremiah said, all the prophets that came before you and me. They all prophesied of war, disaster, and pestilence. All of the prophets that came before us. They all agreed with Jeremiah and not Hananiah. And this is, a, this is a very good model for us to follow. Go back and search the Scriptures. When you're confronted with something, go back and search the Scriptures. See what the testimony of Scripture is on the matter. What does the Bible say about it? Is, is there a theme? Is there a thread? Is there a precedence? Is there a pattern? throughout Scriptures that you can point to and you can say, well, this is what Scripture has always said. I see this thread all through the Old Testament into the New Testament. I see it in the Gospels. I see it in Acts. I see it in the Epistles. Therefore, this is my conclusion. And he's basing his argument on the testimony of Scripture. Not on the testimony of his feelings. Not on the testimony that he hopes happens. He hopes that Hananiah is right. Hey, two years. Amen, so be it. But he knows what the Scriptures say. And the Scripture consistently says there's going to be war, there's going to be disaster, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be a judgment that comes. Then, look at verse 10 now. Oh, he goes, I'm sorry, I skipped verse 9. And for the prophet who prophesies of prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophets comes to pass, that prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Hey, you're saying there's going to be peace? Uh, When that happens, then we'll know you're a prophet. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. Very dramatic. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people saying, Thus says the Lord, Even so, I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. 
So he does this very dramatic, symbolic action, taking the yoke off of Jeremiah's neck. It's made out of wood. He breaks it. And then he makes this declaration once again, two full years, everything's going to be brought back. God's going to break the yoke of the Babylonians. Now look at how Jeremiah responds. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. That's what you call shaking the dust off your feet. He's declared the truth. This guy wants to argue. And he just leaves. Right? That's what you do. Jesus said, if someone doesn't receive you, and receive the, the word that you're declaring, the gospel, shake the dust off your feet and move on to someone who does. And that's what Jeremiah does here. Don't, don't waste your time arguing with someone who doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to receive it. Just move on. And go your way like Jeremiah. Now, between verse 11 and verse 12, some time elapses. We don't know how much time. But there's some time that passes here. And the word of the Lord came again to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron that you can't break. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. They're not going to get out of it, in other words. It's a yoke of iron. And they shall serve him. I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you but you make this people trust in a lie. (laughs) By the way, the text never says that the word of the Lord came to Hananiah. It always says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, but not Hananiah. And he tells him, the Lord has not sent you. You make this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will cast you from the face of of the earth this year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. Now in verses 15 and 16 there's actually kind of a a play on words in the Hebrew when he says the Lord has not sent you to the people. Then he says now he is sending you off the face of the earth. It's a play on words. He hasn't sent you. Now he's sending you. God is sending you now off the face of the earth. You're going to die. Why? Because you've taught rebellion against the Lord. You've taught the people to rebel against His Word. You've taught the people to trust a lie. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. So God struck down Hananiah for lying to the people, for making the people trust in a lie, and for teaching the people to rebel against the Lord. Very, very uh, startling event that happens here. God strikes him dead. Uh, Similar to uh, the New Testament, Acts chapter 5, where you have Ananias and Sapphira who lie about how much money they received for selling their land and what they gave to the church, and God struck them down. And the reason God struck Ananias and Sapphira down is the same reason He strikes down Hananiah here. It's, It's to strike fear in the people. It's to uh, awaken their hearts to the reality of what they're doing. It's, it's, to, it's to shake them awake. The startling thing that happens. But the people of Judah were not awakened by this. They, they, believed, they believed Hananiah. They didn't believe Jeremiah. And, and when this judgment comes down on Hananiah, you'd think that that would be, that would be what wakes people up, but it doesn't. It's not enough to startle them awake. To turn them back to God. You know, God's way may not seem logical to us. It may look difficult. 
It may be the unpopular view, but it's always the better way to go. It's always the better way to go. It's always better than doing what seems right in our own eyes. It's doing what's right in God's eyes. It's always better. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for these chapters. Uh, we thank you for um, your word to us, your truth to us. Lord, we thank you that we have the Bible that we can use, Lord, uh, as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, Lord, to help us just cut through all of the voices competing in the world, all of the voices that are claiming truth to be the way, to be right. Lord, we're thankful that we can go to your word and get the truth to know what's right. Lord, I pray that we would be students of your word, that we would search your scriptures, Lord, and allow your word to uh, shape the things that we do. Even if it's completely unpopular. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Uh, we'll see you this Sunday for John chapter 15, Lord willing.